Hello, I'm Bob Kilman, the Director of Wealth Management at OJM Group, and today we're going to be discussing our 2016 market wrap-up and our outlook for 2017. Before we jump in, it's important to note that this video is for informational purposes only, and the information may not be suitable for your personal circumstances. Please contact a professional before attempting to execute any of these strategies. One other note before we get started, if you find this information reliable and helpful, we would encourage you to check out one of our books. OJM has written multiple books for doctors, business owners, and entrepreneurs. We'll discuss more at the end of the presentation how you can get one of our books. So today we want to talk about uh, the year of 2016, the market. Uh, it was a very obviously volatile market. We started the year out um, with, with a pretty wild swing and correction in January and February. Obviously, we had the election in the fall. Very, very uh, 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 volatile time post-election. We saw you know, a violent reaction within the markets actually on election night, and then there's been several sectors that have done very well post-election. So we want to walk through, look at 2016, how we performed, and then we want to talk about uh, the future. We want to talk about 2017 and talk about you know, what our view at OJM is for the economy, uh, and then specifically the capital markets, what we think from a portfolio standpoint and how we are positioning to be prepared to take advantage of the opportunities that we see uh, in 2017. So let's start with a look back at, at 2016. And again, as I said, this has been a very interesting year. Um, you know, equities overall performed very well on an absolute basis relative to, to bonds. Uh, the U.S. stock market, uh, again, took the lead, and, and this was the eighth straight year that the S&P 500 has had a positive return. So as you can see there from the graph, uh, we're showing there in the, the green uh, bar, year-to-date returns, the blue bar represents the fourth quarter. And so U.S. stocks had a great year. Uh, both large cap, uh, particularly small cap companies, performed very well for the U.S. Uh, we did see a nice year in emerging markets, which was nice to see, a nice rebound from where we've been in previous years. They were very strong, up about 12.2%. Uh, but some gains of their, theirs were given back in the fourth quarter. At, at one point, it was the, the leading asset class as we, uh, as we went through the first three quarters of, of the portfolios. So, and we'll talk in a, in a moment about what sectors really drove the U.S. market and, and what areas uh, w where we did see most of the gains. But um, the, the developed international markets uh, was a laggard uh, for, for portfolios in 2016, returning just 2.7% on a U.S. dollar uh, basis. And European stocks did worse. They, they actually fell slightly uh, down 0.4%. And the biggest driver of the performance uh, or, or lack thereof was uh, currency exposure, was again the, the main reason as the, as the British pound and the euro fell 16 and 3 percent relative to the U.S. dollar. So this was the third straight year that dollar appreciation was a drag on foreign returns. So something um, you know, as we look at as we look at the international markets and we look at the opportunity moving forward, one of the conversations that we have with clients is about currency and and the effects of that on the portfolio. So, um, the the last uh, the last couple items I want to mention are are the bond markets and the alternative investment markets. So, core bond index fell 3.2 percent in the fourth quarter. It was the worst quarterly performance that we've seen in the bond market in 35 years. And certainly that makes a lot of sense. We saw a rate hike in the fourth quarter from the Fed and, and certainly the anticipation is we're going to have more rate hikes in the future. So the fixed income sector with more credit risk and less interest rate risk, um, such as high yield, floating rate, they actually did a very good job, some strong returns, and, and, and thankfully our portfolio is something that we have sort of anticipated the last couple years is we, we've always wanted to be underweight uh, what we consider core or investment-grade bonds 
with the anticipation of a rising interest rate environment, we wanted some, 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 some of our more flexible strategies in fixed income to be able to take advantage of that. And you'll notice some of those, uh, some of those bond markets like floating rate and high yield, they did just that. The alternative market um, overall did okay, um, you know, up about 6.9% for overall alternative strategies that we classify. Um, managed futures were down about 5.4% um, in the fourth quarter and 5% overall as an index. Um, and again, you know, the reason you own alternative investments is really uh, to reduce the correlation um, uh, to U.S. equities, fixed income markets, and drive down a lot of that volatility. So while sometimes we may not get the performance from alternative investments during, uh, during a bull market of the U.S. equity markets, they would certainly play a role as we see corrections pull back uh, to reduce that volatility. So one of the things, I think this is a very interesting uh, uh, slide on you know, 2016 really being a year of market reversals. Uh, the, first, the first column there, you're going to see the previous two-year returns for different types of strategies and then what the return has been since then. So again, emerging market stocks. Um, this is an area that uh, you know we have felt pretty strongly about over the last couple of years, um, adding to positions when 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 there were pullbacks, and a lot of this has to do with valuations and opportunities moving forward. And you'll see we're starting to see that uh, uh, come to fruition as as the, the returns were down 25% versus 28% um, after that two-year period of time. Oil struggled over the last couple of years, and we saw um, over this prep over this past year a big swing up in the price of oil. And you can see small cap versus large cap, value growth, value versus momentum. Really the story of you know what works in the past isn't always necessarily going to be what works in the future. And that's one of the things that's very difficult uh, to maintain that discipline when building portfolios for clients over 10-year periods of time or 15 or whatever the time horizon is for a client understanding and not getting caught up in a short-term news cycle, um, a short-term market cycle where we're making decisions based on what has worked really well, maybe over a three, six, eight, uh, 12 month period of time. So this sort of illustrates that. Um, same in the in the fixed income market you see there, US core bonds and US treasuries, uh, you know, where we saw some strong gains over the last few years, it, we, we finally are seeing that pullback. The, the last part is where I want to focus on just for a moment. So you know, there's been a lot of talk in the fourth quarter about the market hitting highs and Dow 20,000 and, um, you know, this very big market, this, this, this large U.S. market rally. What's interesting is a lot of it's coming just from a couple sectors and, and they, they turn fairly quickly post-election. So what you're seeing is things like energy stocks, financial stocks that have not done very well are doing very, very well uh, post-election. And, and it makes sense, obviously. I mean, if we think about uh, what a uh, what President-elect Trump's uh, 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 campaign has said about regulation, um, interest rates with the Fed, the thought process would be uh, we're, we're likely not going to see more regulation on Wall Street. If anything, it would stay status quo. If not, there will be some some pullback. Um, and then, obviously, with with an increase in interest rates, banks are going to be able to lend at a higher rate, meaning they can drive more profits. So it makes sense that financial stocks will perform well and something we have slowly been adding to and looking to add in our portfolios. But again, it's one of those things where you don't want to get caught up in the short-term news cycle of performance and really focus in on, um, is this something we want to own for the next you know, year, 18 months, three years? Um, and, and that's what we look at. And so there's been this big switch uh, over to things like industrials um, and in energy away from util or, uh, utilities and consumer staples. Um, so a, a very interesting sector shift that we've seen just here in the fourth quarter. So what does that mean moving forward as we look at portfolios um, into this year and beyond? We start out sort of thinking about the economy. Um, the economy, we, we continue to call it a plow horse economy. It's just sort of chugging along here in the U.S. 
you'll, you'll notice on the, the chart on the left, this is currently the fourth longest U.S. expansion and soon to be the third longest that we've seen going back to June of 2009. Now, we hear from clients all the time that they're not feeling the effects of that, and certainly there are, um, there are a variety of reasons for that and pockets of growth and not necessarily going um, you know, and trickling across all levels of, of, of employment, all levels of class, uh, income, but, but it is important to note that we are, um, you know, while it's not a, a booming, um, you know, three, four percent uh, growth rate here in the country right now, we are having that plow horse chug along uh, economy. And so some of the positives I have listed out here to the right, you know, we continue to have a strengthening labor market, and that has been consistent over the last uh, several years. Wages, while not rising as much as we uh, would all hope, are certainly rising. Uh, the the real untold story is improved household balance sheets. You know, pre pre 2009, um, you know, having conversations with clients about not taking on too much leverage was a very difficult thing to do because everyone wanted to take on leverage. Um, you know, as much equity out of the home as they possibly could, um, taking advantage of car loans, a variety of of leverage on the balance sheet, and what 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 we saw was very little savings for 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 folks. So um, you're starting to see, you know, over the last several years, some of that unwinding, um, improved balance sheet, and some of that is because of the lending requirements uh, restrictions have been a little bit higher. But but overall, the the balance sheets at the household levels improved significantly. Consumer confidence has continued to grow uh, quite a bit uh, in the fourth quarter. And then we've had a low interest rate environment and low energy prices. So those are, um, it, you know, low energy prices are like getting a tax break, uh, you know, at, at the pump. You know, you go to the gas pump and instead of, you know, thinking back to 2008, 2009, 10 and 11 where, uh, you know, it was $4 a gallon, you know, now we're under $2 a gallon. And so that, that has really been helpful not only to the consumer but uh, to, uh, to businesses as a whole. Um, and so... Um, low interest rates has certainly been a big driver of that as well. So there are some positives that we look at it. We certainly can point out several headwinds that we are cautiously, you know, looking at um, when it comes to the the economy um, in the U.S. specifically. But these are some of the highlights that we see right now, and some things that we think are going to be important for us to focus on here coming shortly. So as we look at you know the the bull, the base, and the bear case for um, you know this continued economic recovery, or you know, uh, plow horse economy, as we would call it. You know, our, our base case is this moderate uh, continued economic recovery, um, and this would be assuming no major crisis. Um, you know, a normal recession is likely within our our five year time horizon, which is not a negative thing. Um, normal recessions where markets contract a little bit um, for for clients is an opportunity to you know take advantage of. And so we would assume GDP growth rates and interest rates start to normalize toward the end of, of this five-year view. So certainly that's our base case. The bull case would be, you know, U.S. economic growth is above average and earning and or earnings in the period above the long-term trend line. This would be helped by, you know, stronger non-U.S. growth, re-leveraging of the U.S. consumer, corporate investment spending. These things are all possible, and a lot of it's going to have to do with, you know, what we see from the first 100 days, the first 200 days from um, the new, the new, the new administration, and what they what they get accomplished in the way of um, uh, tax reform, health care reform, um, uh, what their foreign policy is going to look like. All of these factors will be things as we look at our portfolios. We focus in on what can we protect um, when we're stress testing to make sure that our clients are protected in a variety of scenarios, but then what can we take advantage of? And so it's a very delicate balance and something we focus on here uh, at OJM every day. As we're looking at portfolios, you know, equity markets, asset classes, they, they really do move in cycles. And as I illustrated earlier, you know, yesterday's losers are typically tomorrow's winners. A question we often get uh, at, at, at our firm, and, and, and I would assume at many firms across the country, is you know, diversification, you know, it's always, you know, why are we not all in U.S. stocks? Um, why do we not, um, why do we even own international stocks? If Bob, if, if, uh, and the team, if, if, 
if we feel like they have not performed well over the last couple of years, why do we own them? And part of it is, you know, certainly there's no crystal ball to, to know what's going to perform well in the next 30 days, 60 days. But, you know, our view is we're looking out at that five-year time horizon uh, for at least the short term. And then certainly we build out longer than that. And you can see here by looking at this chart where um, U.S. stocks will perform um, you know, uh, you know, going back, if you look around 1988 and through into the 90s, U.S. stocks at 72 percent, international stocks at 286. Then right after that, U.S. stocks 463 uh, percent to 48 percent during the next um, couple decades, and then um, then it flips, right? Then U.S. stocks have a very poor period of time. International does pretty well. Um, we've seen this tremendous outperformance from U.S. stocks as, as opposed to international. And there have been uh, have been some reasons. We look at that now as a tremendous opportunity. Um, you know, we added to Europe for for clients uh, in the fourth quarter, and um, you know, so we look at that as a tremendous opportunity on a risk adjusted basis to take advantage of uh, of returns over the next three to five years. And so certainly that is a big part of our positioning as we move forward. So. Our asset class views, um, certainly these change from time to time. Um, we still view U.S. equities as a risk. Um, you know, profit margins are near record highs, and in our view, they're unsustainable. Stocks, uh, stocks are pricey, and historical outcomes from current valuation levels, in our view, again, are, is not encouraging. Now, certainly, there are political dynamics now at play that could give some tailwind to U.S. equities, which we are looking at, which is why we still have a healthy allocation. It's important to note, because we look at an asset class as a risk doesn't mean that we don't own it. We certainly own U.S. equities, um, both in our sector strategies and um, across asset classes. Uh, rising interest rates, certainly a risk. Um, you know, we look at, uh, you know, uh, why we have been underweight core bonds, um, and it's worked out fantastically to have these absolute return-oriented fixed income managers providing yield and doing it in a way with duration that makes a lot of sense in a rising interest rate environment. So again, going to be very challenging for clients that are uh, at retirement, near retirement, to where you know 2004, 2003, you know money market was paying four percent, quality fixed income was paying four percent, five percent, six percent. Um, you know, that's just not available currently. And so, um, you know, clients have, have typically taken more risk than they want to, but, you know, we've been able to, you know, sort of navigate some of that risk by having some of these flexible bond managers and, and alternative investments. International equities, I've mentioned, we do view as an, as a, as an opportunity. Um, st stock valuations certainly are a major reason for this. And, um, you know, we think that uh, there's continued opportunity there. And and uh, market earnings growth will be higher than than what we're currently seeing and what we've seen over the last few years. And so, and you're already seeing that now, um, you know, with emerging markets um, over the last year and certainly uh, uh, Europe over the last even few weeks into the fourth quarter and the start of the first quarter has been a big positive. We always view alternative strategies for the most part as an opportunity. Certainly, we allocate alternatives, whether it be through managed futures long short equity real estate both public and private uh, occasionally commodities and and again our goal with alternative strategies is to provide return in these up and down equity and bond markets so we want to drive absolute returns we want to get returns into the portfolio that that are going to provide us uh, something independent from the traditional stock and bond market why this is important is it's hard to see the value in that when you have up 10, up 12, up 10 uh, U.S. equity markets. Where we really see that is over full market cycles where you are getting those years where the U.S. equity market may be down 8 or 10, um, and you've got a lot of those green arrows in your portfolio. Uh, it's a big driver of long-term performance where you're putting your head down at night on the pillow and saying, you know, this 8 or 9% net fee return um, or 7 or whatever it is you build out with your advisor that you're comfortable with, and these are the types of investments that really help drive that. And so that's one of the things that's very important to us here at OJM. So I wanted to give a little view of, of sort of how we're positioned. Certainly we'll have more of these uh, communications, whether it be through articles and newsletters and videos throughout the year, um, and certainly there may be changes. But as we sort of get into 2017, that's our view 
uh, as we see it today. Today I covered one specific topic in the area of wealth management, but we at OGM have expertise in a number of areas, asset protection, tax reduction, corporate structure, benefit planning, retirement planning, and insurances. Our team has been helping clients for over 20 years. In fact, we've worked with over 1,000 clients throughout the country. We know that every client is unique, and we would love the opportunity to speak with you about how we might be able to bring value to your wealth planning. Get a free copy of Four Doctors Only, Fortune Building for Business Owners and Entrepreneurs, or one of our other books referenced earlier in this presentation. To receive your free book or ebook for Kindle or iPad, please visit www.ojmbookstore.com and use promotional code OJMWeb at checkout. We also offer you a free consultation. Uh, my contact information is there, my email address and phone number directly. Enjoy the free copies of our books and we hope to have the opportunity to speak with you. Thanks for watching.